Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and I have two guests today. It's a married couple. It's Michelle Twitchell and her husband Mark Twitchell. Um, the main topic today is going to be the one that, um, that Mark knows a lot about, but I wanted you to meet Michelle uh, because she just won an election this Very fall. Uh, mm -hmm. She uh, has, she is, there's just one, uh, one trustee in no, each. No, actually there's five trustees. Mm -hmm. And we're the legislative branch mm -hmm. of the village of Fredonia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, right. so that's what she is. She's a village trustee and mm -hmm. uh, she just won the election in 2021. And um, I wanted her to come on so you could meet her. And um, uh, she's gonna tell us what, um, what the job description of a village trustee is. Mm -hmm. um, what is your job? Right. Uh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, we uh, pass laws. We um, uh, take a look at the charter to see what duties need to be done by trustees and uh, therefore various uh, sections of the village. The mayor selects us as uh, in chairman and co-chairman for each department. For instance, I'm on uh, streets and lighting. Oh, so okay. if there was ever anything that came up that needed to be fixed or to, look, to be looked at, I would be the trustee to have to investigate to find an answer for people and perhaps maybe even approach the other trustees to enact a resolution to fix any problems that we have. Would this be like um, potholes in the street and like that? It, it could relate to that, mm -hmm. yes. And then uh -huh. you said lighting too, would that be the street lighting. lights and things? Yes, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm also on uh, water and sewer. Oh, okay. And I'm very happy to be on the water uh, committee because that's what I ran on was uh, the reservoir in Fredonia, which is so important for our village residents. And I feel that uh, we, we really need to take a hard look at that to be able to um, expand our, our water but um, there, there's a lot involved with um, helping us uh, repair the dam mm -hmm. and the uh, spillway and perhaps maybe even putting up a water tower because uh, we're part of the Northern Chautauqua County, well, we would like to be part of the Northern Chautauqua County Water District okay. and to supply other areas of the town of Pomfret with water. But first, we have to make sure that we're able to do that. So that would be my job along with another trustee to look into that oh, okay. situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of episodes back, um, I had um, the, um, let's see, what does he call himself? The executive director of the Watershed Conservancy of Chautauqua County on, and that was a really okay. interesting topic. Yes, so, yes. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, um, and in a way, um, my, my water concerns are related to what Mark's going to speak about today because mm -hmm. I feel, along with my husband, that if, if we put wind turbines in Lake Erie, that's going to unsettle uh, sediments that are in the bottom of oh, the lake oh, yeah, and yeah. disturb the water. So we really want to have fresh water for everyone. Right. And that's one of my concerns oh, also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're both on the same side. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> for a good reason. Okay, shall we move along to Mark yes, then? Yes, thank you okay. so much. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark. Um, Mark is going to talk about the wind turbine situation in the waters of Lake Erie. And Mark is a member of the Citizens of Fredonia, is a member of the Citizens Against Wind Turbines in Lake Erie. Uh, thank you for coming on, Mark. Thank you, Gail. It's really good to be here. Yeah. Now, the first question is, um, why does New York State want to put wind turbines in the waters of Lake Erie? 
Well, in 2019, the New York State Legislature passed what is called the Climate Act. The, uh, the full name of the Climate Act is the, the Community uh, uh, Protection and Climate Leadership Act. And it's a very uh, broad-reaching legislation and one of the key elements is that New York State is by law required to reduce its uh, e uh, emissions of greenhouse gases in the generation of electricity by 70% by the year 2030. So in other words, we have eight years to reduce our uh, emissions uh, in electricity uh, such that 70% of the electricity generated in New York State comes from what we call renewable resources. Mm -hmm. And New York State has defined renewable resources as hydropower, for example, Niagara Falls, and wind and solar energy facilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, which part of the New York State government is making the plans? for the Lake Erie wind turbine project? Uh, at this point, the, um, the, the lead agency or the lead organization um, in New York State to consider putting wind turbines in Lake Erie is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Now, the abbreviation for this is NYSERDA, and it's important to note that NYSERDA is not a state agency. NYSERDA is a hybrid uh, a state organization that includes um, uh, private enterprise. It could be defined as a public benefit corporation. Mm -hmm. NYSERDA has a board of directors consisting of 12 uh, directors. And at this point, seven of these directors are affiliated with financial institutions. And these financial institutions are uh, what we would call green energy uh, financial institutions or renewable energy financial institutions. They are a specific part of, of uh, Wall Street, if you will, or the larger uh, financial community that uh, concentrates on uh, lending money to uh, wind and solar energy uh, developers. Okay. Um, who is the group Citizens Against Wind Turbines in Lake Erie, and what evidence do they have in opposition to the state's plan? Well, the short answer to Citizens Against Wind Turbines in Lake Erie is that it's a group of approximately 4,000 folks who all share a particular concern that uh, the, the placement of wind turbines in Lake Erie is, is, is just not a good idea. Uh, it's, it's a very diverse group. We have, uh, uh, we have aquatic biologists. We have uh, a large representation from the, the, the fishing community, sport fishing in particular. And we have uh, a number of, of members who um, have a, a, a background in electricity generation so that uh, uh, although we're a, a fairly informal group, uh, our, our main strength at, at this point is represented by the Facebook page, Citizens Against Wind Turbines in Lake Erie. Uh, we, we do have a, a, a meeting structure whereby we meet uh, once a month at, at various locations throughout the, uh, the, the, the proposed project area. Um, that would range, for example, from Dunkirk uh, all the way uh, uh, down the lake to Hamburg. Oh, okay. Um, and and the second part of the question, Gail, is you know <laughs> what what evidence do we, does our group have that uh -huh. this is not a good idea? Right. And um, I, I'd like to lead off with um, the, in my opinion, the the, the the largest evidence is the fact that the technology is not adequate to to either reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to represent a modern functioning economy. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is fairly simple. Uh, and it is that the wind does not blow 
all the time. No. Now that that <laughs> might seem to be you know a fairly obvious yeah. <laughs> observation, but um, the uh, the the easiest way for uh, our viewers to to actually see for themselves that the wind is not blowing all the time is to go to the website of New York State Independent Systems Operator. Now, who is the New York State Independent Systems Operator? It is a nonprofit organization of engineers and, and, uh, uh, and financial advisors. Their responsibility is to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. Their responsibility is to make sure that the, the power grid that supplies all of New York State is stable mm -hmm. and that there are no interruptions in the power such that, for example, uh, we can enjoy this conversation in, in, this, uh, in this, this room with lighting, cameras, uh, high-tech equipment. Uh, we can keep hospitals running 24-7. We can keep schools operating. Uh, an interruption in the power grid, uh, otherwise known as a blackout, is, is not a casual event. It's mm -hmm. very expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very destructive, uh, as evidence in Texas last year when, oh, yeah. when the grid failed and, and you know, hundreds of people uh, lost their lives as a result. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. the responsibility of, of New York State independent systems operator is to prevent that. Um, and the evidence that this organization uh, presents is available at their website. And if there was one bit of information that I could share with our viewers, it is that this website is a, a, a treasure trove of, of data um, about all manner of New York State electricity generation. So it's New York Independent Systems Operator, we abbreviate that, NISO, dot com and we can all go there at any point in time when I left the house this morning to come to the studio I went to the to the site and I saw the wind energy in New York State at this point represents 1.75 percent of all of the energy in New York State oh, oh so God. that is you know, that might raise alarm considering the fact that um, other sources of power represent much, obviously, much greater uh, generation. Uh, when I looked it up, this is just maybe 45 minutes ago, um, hydropower, largely Niagara Falls, is 25% of our power. Um, nuclear power, 22%. Uh, Gas-generated electricity, 18%. And what they call dual fuels, which could either be gas or could be oil generation at 28%. So against this, we have wind at 1.75% and other renewables, which would include solar, at 1.4%. Mm -hmm. So if, in fact, we have eight years to bring this renewable energy source up to 70%, we have a long way to go. Uh, water already represents 25%, and it's not likely in New York State that there are Un, untapped, although this is debatable, there are those who feel that yes, we indeed we could expand our hydro facilities. But to try and get 70% of our electricity from wind and solar, when the wind does not blow all the time, when the sun does not shine oh, all the time. Oh, we had a really rainy year this year, too. <laughs> I mean, oh, not in the spring. It was sunny in the spring, but uh, the summer and the fall and the winter mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Cloudy I mean, and rainy. We, we love to observe the weather, but however, we don't necessarily love it when our when our power grid is dependent upon the weather. Right. That's right. that's just that's, that's not a good look. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it 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 won't work well for us. And uh, that's that is one of the primary concerns that our citizens group has. Is that gee whiz, you know, it, this is this is not working up to this point. Um, we have in New York State 22, roughly 22,000 megawatts of wind turbines installed. It, it's actually 1990, uh, but we round that off to, to 2,200 uh, total megawatts installed. And obviously they intend to put a lot more wind turbines installed. Uh, that could be onshore and, and, and offshore. 
but again, when the wind doesn't blow, you're going to get the same result. <laughs> it, it, you know, zero <laughs> times any other number is always going to be zero. Right, right, <laughs> right. Well, I think you've already answered the next question I had. It was about the New York Independent Systems operator uh, and their website there. Yes, uh, NISO.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, now let's talk about the differences between, um, I, for those of you in the viewing audience, I used an article that Mark wrote in order to make up the questions to ask him today. And um, I want to talk about the differences on December 6th and December 8th of the state's wind turbines produced powers. What happened on those two days? Well. On December 6th, it was, it was a, a landmark day for wind energy in New York State. Um, because the wind was, was blowing productively, that is, at, at, a, at a very sweet spot. In other words, it, it obviously has to be more than zero, but it also has to be less than 50 miles an hour of wind. If the wind gusts exceed anywhere from 40 to 50 miles an hour, the machines automatically shut down because they will, they will self-destruct. They will spin at a rate that, that will, is dangerous to the, to the, to the equipment. So oh. on, on December 6th, um, the, the 2,200 megawatts of installed uh, wind turbines in New York State generated, um, uh, uh, that represent an 82% efficiency of, of those wind turbines, which is quite remarkable. Um, but what led up to December 6th was December 5th, where the, the wind turbines spent most of the day generating almost zero electricity. And after December 6th came, obviously, the 7th and the 8th, where by looking at the NISO.com, what they call the real-time fuel dashboard, and, and what I mean by that is that uh, on this website, there is a, you can click on uh, a, a, a metric that shows you for every five minute period, how much power is being generated by all of these various sources. On December 6th, it, it really, it, it beat the band. But on December 5th, the, delay, the day before the record breaking productivity, it was, it was, it was wimpy. And over the time on the 7th, it, it dwindled down to zero. And on the 8th, it spent most of the day at or around zero. Now, the, the CEO of NYSERDA made quite a, a big deal over December 6th when the wind turbines were generating at such a high percentage of efficiency. But they, they didn't, <laughs> they conveniently didn't mention anything or apologize to the taxpayers and the rate payers <laughs> for the poor performance of these machines on, on the 5th and the 8th, just because the wind stopped blowing. Okay, um, now NYSERDA is, um is that a state agency, did you say? It is not a state agency. It is, it is, it is an authority. However, it is granted by New York State uh, the, the powers to avoid the environmental law of New York State. We've all heard of the State Environmental Quality Review Act, which we abbreviate by S-E-Q-R-A, or in speak, we, we, they, it's the seeker. Well, an, an important part of the seeker is what we call the environmental impact statement. And up to this point, NYSERDA has not offered an environmental impact statement. They have studied the possibility of putting wind turbines in the freshwater of Lake Erie, but they have not offered to the, the voters, the taxpayers, and the electricity rate payers, they have not offered a detailed plan of how much this would cost, how much greenhouse gases would be eliminated by this project, and what the environmental impact would be. We hope that a environment, at an environmental impact statement is forthcoming, but we, we, have no, we have no assurance that that, that is, in fact, is going to happen. Hmm. Okay, um, 
Now, NYISO, the New York Independent Systems Operator, is a good source of information then um, as far as the realities of wind energy? It, it takes just a few seconds to, to uh, enter into your search engine, NISO.com, and right away on your screen, uh, sure enough, the website will come up. It'll, it'll, it'll show real-time dashboard. And that is the actual graph where all of the power sources are displayed in five-minute segments. Okay. Now, um, how many days in 2021 did efficiency of the wind turbines exceed 60%? Our organization did an audit of the NISO archives. That's another advantage of the NISO site. You can click on their archives and you can see what the power generation data is for, again, all of these sources for uh, historical periods. We looked at the period between uh, January and October uh, in the year 2021, and we found that there were only six days when the wind turbines produced electricity at an efficiency exceeding 60%. In other words, when NYSERDA, the NYSERDA CEO was so excited about Jan December 6th, there were actually only six days between January and October where we had that much or close to that much generation from the uh, wind turbines in New York State. Okay, um, how many uh, days uh, could the wind turbines produce only 100 megawatts most of the day? There were, there were actually 62 days between January and October of 2021, 62 days where the turbines could produce 100 megawatts for most of the day. Uh, it's, when you look at the, at the NISO.com real-time dashboard, the, the data is displayed every five minutes. Now, because the wind is variable, on some days you'll see that the generation spikes up to, you know, a few thousand uh, or, or, you know, 1,500 megawatts, let's say. But then it, when you go back, have lunch, go back, enter the site again, and they're back to zero. Mm -hmm. So when we say there were 62 days where the turbines could not produce 100 megawatt for most of the day, that's, that's by eyeballing the, uh, the data and you know, looking, well, gee whiz, most of the time it, it really was, was so low as to be almost almost negligible. Oh, okay. But there were there might have been times where it did spike up higher, but again, most of the time it 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 was very little. Okay. Um how many days were the turbines fun how many days out of the year were the turbines functioning at less than 30% efficiency about 66 megawatts. Well, the 30% the figure that you're asking about, Gail, is, is very relevant because the wind industry, the turbine manufacturers, the developers who purchase the turbines and put them where they will, they are claiming that in New York State, the wind resource is so sufficient that on average, the wind turbines perform at 30% efficiency. However, if we look at the dates between January and October of 2021, we found that there were 235 days where the machines functioned at less than 30% efficiency for oh. most of the day. In other words, the, the majority the, of the year. <laughs> the, the, the industry is, is using data and numbers that do not reflect what any of us can see by looking at the actual generation statistics at any point in time. Okay. Um, now, the average daily amount of power from all fuel sources 
per five per five minute period. Um, now, how much how much is that? Well, the, when you go to the NISO site, it, it displays how much power do all people in New York State use. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the same thing as how much power in, do do all generation sources create. In other words, in New York State, on the average day. We, we generate about 14 to 16,000 megawatts to, to, uh, to meet the needs of all citizens and industry in New York State. Okay, now there's a much larger number um, of total daily power consumption than what New York State is apparently able to produce? The, yes, um, the, the total amount of power that we use on an average day is 16 to 18,000 megawatts. Mm -hmm. Of that, course, that varies. That's a lot more than what's produced by all yes. of the different sources within New York State. So obviously we are importing energy, electricity from other states in order to, to meet our needs. That's, that's, not, that's not necessarily a criticism, that's just, uh, you know, that's just the way it is in New York State. Um, but when you look at how much power the wind turbines generate on any given day, they're not even making up the difference. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we have to import more power every day than the wind turbines can make. Yeah. Um Okay, uh, so how many, how many megawatts are imported on a daily basis? On a daily basis, anywhere from, uh, it, it usually comes out to about two. 2,000 2, 2, megawatts that we need to import on a daily basis. It's, it's worth noting that most of that is generated from fossil fuels. Uh-huh, okay. Um, wow. Now tell us about the CEO of NYSERDA and the CEO's board of, and the board of directors of NYSERDA. Uh, would you tell us something about them? Well, they're all, you know, knowledgeable people. Mm -hmm. they, they have a background in, in, in politics and in, in, uh, in the social aspects of, of uh, administering New York State. They're, they're concerned citizens. They, uh, they are advocating for the, the goals that the Climate Act has put into legislation. Um, but their, their website, the NYSERDA website, is, gives a nice uh, biography of all 12 of their board members. And what the board of directors of NYSERDA lacks generally is experience in the engineering and the technical uh, aspects of the electricity business. Mm -hmm. So that they're, they're highly motivated, um, they're very concerned, but my criticism and the criticism of my group, the Citizens Against Wind Turbines in Lake Erie is, these are not the folks that we depend upon to keep the lights, the lights on. Oh yeah. And and the biggest uh, objection that I personally have is that of the 12 board of directors, seven have direct ties. As I said a few minutes ago, seven of them are, uh, are, are, are bankers. Oh. They're, they're, they're financial <laughs> ad, ad, advisors and consultants. These are the people that actually are going to make a lot of money by putting wind turbines not just in Lake Erie, but obviously throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And one, one member of their board of directors is actually appointed by the governor to be the chairperson of uh, what is known as the siting board. That is the board that approves all wind turbine locations in New York State that are on land. Oh. Uh, we don't know yet uh, what is the mechanism for putting wind turbines in Lake Erie. Um, all of the wind turbines on land 
are, are a complex regulatory uh, structure from relating to, to towns and you know, municipal governments. But the, the, the Lake Erie is without any local jurisdiction. Lake Erie belongs to the state. Lake Erie belongs to the, actually, I want to rephrase that. Lake Erie belongs to the people of New York State. And there is such a thing as the public trust doctrine, which states that use of New York State land must benefit all the people of New York State. And as it appears to many, if the wind turbines are put in Lake Erie, the benefit goes to a, a very small group of special interest folks. Okay. Um, would wind turbines sacrifice the economy and ecology of Lake Erie, and how would it do that? Well, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let's start with drinking water quality. Um, as we know, Lake Erie has recently, within the last few decades, rebounded from a century of industrial abuse. Factories discharged their industrial waste into the lake. It's just the way things were done. Those of us who are a little bit older can remember you know, going to the lake in the 60s and 70s and trying to enjoy a day at the beach. Um, the water was foul. Uh, there were high concentrations of, of, of algae. It was like swimming in green pea soup. Uh, there were a number of industrial and domestic pollutants, such as phosphates, that drove the, the, the aquatic plants to such obnoxious levels. But industrially, there were heavy metals, mercury, arsenic. There were uh, toxic compounds like PCBs related to uh, electricity uh, generation and insulation. Um, quite a, quite a, a toxic brew of contaminants got dumped in the lake where they exist today. Fortunately, as the sediments at the lake bed have shifted, most of this bad stuff is what is called, is sequestered. It's covered by a layer of sediment and sand and so forth. So how are we going to put these machines in the lake without anchoring them in some way? They're going to have to be affixed to the bottom of the lake and in so doing disturb this sediment layer. Now, there are approximately 11 million people who depend upon the quality of the water in Lake Erie. And it includes not only you know, New York State residents, but residents in Ontario, and all the way downstream in Lake Erie through uh, 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 all the way down to um, the St. Lawrence River and, and out to the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. and uh, are we jeopardizing water quality for, for an intermittent source of power that on most days it can't show itself effectively um, reducing greenhouse gases? That's, that's, that's a pretty big objection right there. Um, and NYSERDA has done nothing to reassure us that the, the proposed wind turbine project is, is going to be done in a safe fashion. How about the economy of the fishing industry, the sport fishing industry? It's a billion dollar industry here in New York State. Do we really want to restrict access to the open waters of Lake Erie? Do the fishing charters really want to be told that they can only go out so far because to go any further now, we're going to run afoul of where the wind turbine installations are? We have a, a highly sophisticated weather radar system in place to detect storms as they come across Lake Erie. You've probably noticed when you watch any of the local Buffalo weather broadcasts, the, the weather radar clearly indicates where the wind turbines are. And it looks like there's a storm in Chautauqua County because the wind turbines in the towns of Arkwright and, and Charlotte and uh, Cherry Creek show up on the weather radar as a storm. The weather announcer is always having to explain, now folks, don't this is not a, a, a thunderstorm in Chautauqua County. This is the wind turbines. Well, 
NYSERDA is looking at the possibility of 50, a row of 50 wind turbines from Dunkirk as far up to Hamburg. How is that going to show up on the weather radar? Is that going to be a disturbing uh, factor to you know, people who are planning their day? Uh, or are we all going to have to get used to the fact that, to pay no attention to that weather radar, it's really not telling us what's out there. But worse than that, the national defense radar system that has been installed all along the shore of Lake Erie to detect uh, smuggling across the lake, illegal immigrants across the lake, this weather, this radar system is also dependent upon not being interfered with by electromagnetic interference from wind turbines. Uh, so we've got fishing, we've got radar interference, we've got uh, water toxicology concerns. Um, and, and we have just the plain old concerns of people who look to the lake as a source of pleasure, recreation, and serenity. Mm -hmm. It's no wonder so many people have horrible, nasty diseases like all kinds of cancer and stuff, you know, um, with the kind of uh, toxins that you mentioned that are covered up by the sediment in Lake Erie that you don't want to have stirred up. We, we've worked a long time. I, I credit the New York State you know, government, the, the Department of Environmental Conservation, all of the, the, the private groups that, that worked so hard for so many years to clean the water of Lake Erie so that the fish are thriving again, so that, so that it's a reliable source of water for all of the communities along the lake. But now to turn around for this group of, you know, special investors who want to profit from putting uh, these machines in the water, it just seems like we're reverting to some sort of, you know, robber baron, uh, you know, the days of steel making and, and, and uh, heavy industry where we just looked the other way when, when their junk got thrown in the lake. Yeah. Well, you know, um there's other things that I've heard about, um, like um, as, as far as greenhouse gases and like that are concerned. Um, apparently, uh, animal agriculture, and this is not, um, this is not <laughs> really common knowledge, Animal agriculture is actually uh, more than 60% of the greenhouse gases. C that combined with how much of the rainforest has been cut down to provide um, extra land for grazing. Uh, the use of water is pretty outrageous. Uh, a lot of people uh, will ask questions like, uh, well, what are we supposed to do with all those animals? But what they don't understand is if you're not eating too much meat and dairy products and all that kind of stuff, um, there wouldn't be as many animals because there wouldn't be all of those artificial inseminations and things <laughs> to produce all these animals. And then the animal agriculture industry like um, Encur encourages people to eat more and more and more of this stuff, which is not, which is not good for people to eat too much. Well, I totally agree, Gail, and and you're pointing out, you know, one of the one of the paradoxes in 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 individual actions. We all want to be responsible for our actions. We've known for years that if we ate less meat, it would result in a healthier climate. We, we've known for years that if we used less electricity, uh, that, that uh, it would be a healthier climate. But have we actually done that? Or are, are we actually structured? Is, is our society actually structured to the point where you know, people can, can make these choices? Yeah, it's not the kind of thing that you actually hear. You hear about all of the uh, fossil fuels contributing to the problem, but you rarely ever hear like on a, you know, a radio program or anything about it. You rarely, they rarely mention the effect that animal agriculture has on things. And you know, the cutting down of too many trees and, um, and then um, it's my understanding according to um, 
reading and listening to other people's uh, speaking on the topic and, and so forth, that um, apparently at some point in time it was decided that marijuana would be illegal because, um, because you could run your car on uh, refined hemp seed oil and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but anyways, you know, appar apparently you can. You can make plastic out of uh, refined hemp seed oil. There's, uh, you can make cloth and paper and everything out of it. And uh, one time when my husband and I went to uh, um, a veg fest down in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, there was a food truck there that had come, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, it had come from the state of Michigan. And somehow the, um, the food truck was fixed so that it could run on vegetable oil. Mm -hmm. So uh, that truck came from Michigan to provide food at the Veg Fest. And it got there uh, by using uh, using vegetable oil for its um, for its fuel. There, you're bringing up a, a great point. You know, the biology can can definitely be put to more use than it is mm -hmm. at, at this point in time. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of plant sources that are high in fiber, high in oils. Uh, there's, uh, uh, it, it, we're limited to some extent by right. our, our, our imaginations and mm -hmm. but again by a, a, a systemic uh, industrial society that uh, precludes looking for other sources of energy uh, because again it's not in, in somebody's financial interest to <laughs> right. do that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, apparently, um, originally here in the United States, um, paper was made of hemp. It wasn't made up by cutting down trees. Um, uh, even George Washington grew it, the first president of the United States. and. Um, but it was very, at that time, you know, they didn't have a lot of machines and things that could uh, do a lot of uh, the work for uh, manufacturing those kinds of things. So uh, the slave, the slave industry, basically, the slaves took, uh, did all of the work with um, making, um, with the uh, hemp to make it into paper and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was extremely difficult work, apparently. Um, so when slavery was abolished, that was, when they, uh, that was when they discontinued making paper out of hemp and switched to cutting down trees. Very interesting. The, you know, the, the amount of energy required for an agricultural operation mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the Climate Act contains, uh, as I said, s several broad ranging uh, uh, initiatives. There's an organization called the, the Climate Action Council. It's a 20 person council that is charged with actually implementing the plan to reduce the, uh, the use of fossil fuels to generate electricity. And the, this council is, is looking at um, all manner of ways to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, one of the things that they're advocating now is uh, to, they're actually considering banning the use of firewood for heating in New York State. Because uh, again, it 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 r releases you know, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, and particulate matters, uh, th like th that was always one of the biggest problems with burning coal to create energy is where all of these particulates, fine particles, very small, that lodge in in our in our respiratory systems and contribute to illnesses. 
the, uh, the Climate Action Council it, it is interested in electrifying everything. That's pretty much their buzzword. Mm -hmm. Now, how so far we've managed to electrify a very small percentage of automobiles, but how are we going to electrify tractors? How are we going to electri electrify the very equipment necessary to, to run an agricultural mm -hmm. economy? Mm -hmm. they, they have uh, absolutely no, uh, no idea how to accomplish that. And it, it, for people interested, the, the Climate Action Council just released their scoping plan a week ago, and, and uh, they are seeking public comment. They're going to accept public comment for the next year on uh, uh, what, how, how do we feel about the Climate Action Council's plans. Uh, they haven't told us how they're actually going to do what they want to do, nor have they told us how expensive it's going to be. There's quite a, a large effort in the New York State Legislature to force them to actually tell us. Uh, our, our Chautauqua County Leg uh, uh, Senator Borello and Assemblyman Goodell are, uh, are uh, supporting a bill that calls for uh, an actual cost-benefit analysis of what the Climate Action Council wants to do. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say that, we, that we, we want to do such and such and down the line, but where's, who's going to pay, how much, mm -hmm. and how well is it going to work? Mm -hmm. A cost-benefit analysis has yet to come from any uh, authority or agency in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I heard something on national public radio, gosh, I think maybe within the last couple of weeks or so, um, about a certain amount of buildings when they're built, they're going to have them built so that all of the heating and everything in them is, is just electric. Right, that's one of the, the Climate Action Council's, um, uh, it, 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 it may actually be one of their low-hanging fruits because uh, obviously uh, geothermal energy in the form of heat pumps, uh, that's not a new technology. It's not a necessarily a controversial technology. It obviously has a fairly low environmental footprint. Um, whether we can rely on heat pumps in Chautauqua County to keep our homes warm mm -hmm. is, is debatable. Well, but. yeah, that, <laughs> the thing of it is, is there, if you have a power outage in the middle of the winter and your house is heated with just electricity, you're, you're not going to be able to keep your house heated with that. And what if they've told us not to put, you know, a, a fire in your wood stove or, right. or your fireplace right. to heat your house, what, what choices do they have for us? I know. That, that's what I'm thinking. You, you kind of need a backup plan. Uh, if you're heating with electricity. In fact, you do. Yeah. And at this point, the backup plan is fossil fuels. Uh -huh. The backup plan is nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. the, the, the backup plan is hydroelectric energy mm -hmm. to make up for the fact that if we electrify everything and we depend upon the weather to do so, mm -hmm. obviously we're going to need another power generating system mm -hmm. to make up for when the weather is not cooperative. Right, right. We're building two power generating systems. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say on the topic, Michelle? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, preserving our water source in the village of Fredonia because uh, it's it's really needed to have a backup, it, as you were talking about electricity. We need a backup resource for water. I know Dunkirk had a, a, a really big water break on Lakeshore Drive. and uh, Was that recently? That was back in the fall, I believe. Okay. And, uh, and we had to supply the city of Dunkirk with water, the village of Fredonia. Uh, it, it just seems to me that we really have to take care of our resources better because of climate change and you know what what we're going to rely on is uh, the water source that we have available to us and the water reservoir in Fredonia is is a wonderful source of water 
and uh, we learn we have to learn how to manage that water so we can provide that backup. Yeah, yeah. Um. It just seems to me that uh, um, some people want us to do away with the reservoir, but that would cost just as much money as it would to improve the, the reservoir. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been uh, working since the 1800s. I mean, why, why do we want to do away with that now? Uh, to yeah. me, we, yeah. we really need that. Yeah. water resource. And if and we have to, I'm sorry Gail, if we have to go back up if the Fredonia water system is not working or if we decide to decommission it, that's right. obviously the source of water would ways. be Lake Erie or, from or, via Dunker. Or going to the store mm -hmm. and buying bottled water. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and putting it in our washing yeah. machine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, I'm not sure th that might be awfully <laughs> expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're down to six and a half minutes here now. Uh, what else? Is there anything else you would uh, like to contribute uh, to our conversation here? Well, we could probably talk about this all day. Oh, oh please. There's a lot. I could go on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my uh, pet peeves about the, the wind industry is getting an honest answer from the the developers who install these machines in terms of how much power do they create mm -hmm. because as we see from the niso.com site this morning it was generating 1.75 percent mm -hmm. but what what they won't tell us is how much power is required to run the machines. Mm -hmm. so a wind turbine is, consider it a giant electric appliance. It does not generate its own power. Mm -hmm. It is dependent upon the power grid for operational functions such as the lighting, the electronic controls, and the electric pumps that turn the blades of the machine into the wind so that it's at its most favorable um, angle. These all require power at all times. How much power does a wind turbine require? Now that seems to be a simple answer, simple question, and we've asked it in so many different ways. Oh, but nobody's answered it? Well, the, the wind industry and the wind energy developers refuse to answer the question. And they, they, they base their refusal on property rights law. In other words, if you are selling a product, you do not need to disclose to the public all the ingredients of the product. Or you do not need to, to disclose to the public all of the uh, performance parameters of the product. Because if you did that, a competitor could you know, learn your particular um, uh, manufacture and gain an unfair advantage. Uh -huh. It's called trade secret law. Uh -huh. And there is not a wind developer in the world who has disclosed to any public anywhere what these machines require to function. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> there was a picture in one of the newspaper, local newspapers recently um, where Andy Goodell is standing in front of a pile of discarded, uh, worn out uh, wind turbine blades. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looks like a little ant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> standing in front of these huge mammoth things. The, those <laughs> huge mammoth things are 100 feet long. They weigh up to 20 tons. 40 for one blade? For one blade. Right. And 40% of the weight of each blade is plastic in the form <gasps> of epoxy resin. Now, if, if all of the plastic stayed in the blade and didn't go anywhere, that would be bad enough because you can't make epoxy plastic without oil or gas. The plastic, all plastics come from oil or gas. There is some recycling, it's almost a joke. 
However, all the plastic in a wind turbine blade does not stay in the blade. It sheds. It sheds what we call microplastic particles. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the public is fairly familiar with microplastics. In Chautauqua County, we are we're fortunate to have a, a professor at our university, State University of New York at Fredonia, who did some of the groundbreaking work on microplastic concentrations of the fresh water of the Great Lakes. Sherry? Yep, Sherry Mason. <laughs> you should have her on your show. Yeah, I, I be haven't great. been able to get a hold of her. I've, I've okay. tried to get a hold of her and haven't really. She spoke at a couple of our uh, vegetarian society dinners uh, several years back. Uh, I had heard her talk at um, some sort of a water program they put on at the, at the Greystone Nature Preserve one mm -hmm. year. And uh, so we, she, I, I sp had a chance to, uh, we asked her, she came to two of our vegetarian society dinners and uh, spoke about uh, the problems uh, with the plastics in, in the water. And um, uh, yeah, lots of people came to the dinners <laughs> when she was, some people who didn't even come for the dinner came after we ate, you know, just to be there so that they could ask her questions and things. And I would love to have her on. Sherry, if you're watching, give me a call. I want to interview you on Fresh Perspectives. So, the, uh, um, so these microplastics are landing on our land, in our creeks, and our ponds, and they're going to land in Lake Erie if Nyserda gets its way. Mm -hmm. Now, so these little microplastic particles consist about 40 percent of the weight of each particle is made of bisphenol A, BPA. You might remember that BPA is a toxic product that has been banned from, from baby bottles right. and sippy yes, cups. Yes. BPA is what is known as an endocrine endocrine disruptor. disruptor. Yes, so yes. we are shedding particles and BPA in our environment and it, it into the lake it goes and and what's what is the response where how how do we win this argument with people that say if we don't do this the lake is going to get worse how is the lake going to get worse if we don't do this? But, but we need to be prepared to answer the, the special interest groups and, and those environmental groups like Sierra Club that receive funding from the renewable energy industry. The Sierra Club's board of directors is represented on, again, the green financial companies and the renewable energy developing companies. And they are, they are going to argue that if we don't put wind turbines in the lake, the lake will get worse. And, and I'm, I'm really having a hard time trying to uh, anticipate this argument and how indeed they're, they're going to present it. Well, I'm afraid, this is so interesting, but I'm afraid we've come to the end of another episode of uh, Fresh Perspectives. And I want to thank you both, Michelle and, and Mark, for being uh, agreeing to appear on um, Fresh you, Perspectives. Gail. Thank you, Gail. Oh, you're it's welcome. Been you're a welcome. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Pleasure. And I'll see those of you in the viewing audience on the next episode.